Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. So uh, last week we talked about, I was doing a presentation mostly on uh, biblical and Christian perspectives on going to prison for conscience. And this week is more focused on, well, why, uh, in a more practical sense, perhaps, and also uh, the experience of it. And this is partly in response to some of the questions that were put in the chat box last week. Perhaps I should say that, you know, obviously some of us who are leading these sessions, these are not cheap words. This is, we have already uh, either risked being going to prison or have actually been in prison. I have myself. Um, I want to start by just reading a, a short uh, text from the Gospels from Jesus um, and some of the hard teachings of Jesus suffered to reflect on that time like this. From Matthew chapter 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies, enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Just pause for a moment to reflect on those challenging words. Ask God to guide us, to help us to be worthy of Jesus, to follow him, to take up our cross. And as a kind of reflection on those words, I'm going to repeat some of the words from Daniel Berrigan that I read out last week. As we are in a situation of trying to stop the war on God's earth and to build peace with God's earth. So Daniel Berrigan said, what's of the price of peace I could add with, with God's earth? How many of us are so afflicted with the wasting disease of normals that even as we declare for peace, our hands reach out with an instinctive spasm in the direction of our loved ones, of our comforts, our home, our security, our income, our future, our plans, that five-year plan of studies, that 10-year plan of professional status, that 20 year plan of family growth and unity, that 50 year plan of a decent life and honorable natural demise. Of course, let us have peace, we cry, but at the same time, let us have normals. Let us lose nothing. Let our lives stand intact. Let us know neither prison nor ill repute, nor the disruption of ties. And because we must encompass this and protect that, and because at all costs, at all costs, our hopes must march on schedule, because it is unheard of that in the name of peace, of disjoining that fine and cunning web our lives have woven, because it is unheard of that good people should suffer injustice, of families be sundered, of good repute be lost. Because of this, we cry, peace, peace, and there is no peace.
I think Daniel Berrigan's words are a reflection or interpretation of the words of Jesus. They show us why there might be divisions within families and households and why it might be important to say that at times taking up our cross, being willing to suffer the punishments of the state as Jesus did might mean having to love God apparently at least more than our family and in this way in losing our lives we might find it. This was said to me when, when, I, came, when I came out of prison, what about your mum, what about your parents? This was my response, these words of Jesus. Let's just pause for a moment to reflect on that. So a couple of questions from the chat box last week. One, of, one was asking for clarification of what the positive results are from going to prison. I could talk about this and I will in a moment, but I think the first most important thing to say is this, that we all crave too much certainty about the effects of our actions. There are too many unknowns. And that is always and everywhere going to be inevitable. No two situations where we take these kinds of actions in any kind of political situation are ever the same. The kind, this kind of thing is not recreatable. It would be like asking a footballer to recreate a moment of genius during a match, impossible. Or like a footballer asking his manager if I, take, if I make this forward pass or this run or this cross, will it lead to a goal? Of course, the answer has to be probably not, but it might. What is certainly true is that if you don't make this pass or run or cross, if you play it safe, if you pass sideways or backwards, if the whole team, all they ever do is try to keep possession, they will never score a goal. The second important thing to say about this is that the main thing to get right, to, ha to have a positive result, to use that phrase, whatever that might be, the main thing to get right is the action that leads to it. The action has to be right, has to be the right thing to do, bearing in mind that in these situations, there is never only one right thing to do. There are lots of options although there are also, of course, plenty of wrong things to do. But I could say perhaps that there is a, what you might call a multiplier effect. If the action has an impact of two, for example, and the punishment, to use a word, has an impact of two, then two multiplied by two is four. If the action has an impact of 10, and the punishment has an impact of 10, then maybe the impact of the result is 100. But as I say, all of this is unknown. You can't really quantify these things, certainly not in advance. It's easy to do that in hindsight. That action was great, and that willingness to accept that punishment was powerful. I'd like to do that. But it will never be the same again. We saw that with the April 2019 rebellion and the rush of people to get involved after. It all looked so easy and so popular. But when it got hard and tough, most of those people melted away. We have to be willing, therefore, to take risks. Obviously, calculated risks, but risks. We have to be willing to do something that is just right, to take a chance, like the football player passing forward, or a cricketer aiming for a six that might get them out. 
But yes, there are things that can be said about results. One very pragmatic thing that was said before XR started and is still around was that some journalists were asked, how many people in prison at the same time for a protest would it take to get on the front pages? Some said 50, some said 100, for example. So it could bring the issue of the climate and ecological emergency and our response and the political questions around it back to the front pages of the tabloids if that many people were in prison at the same time. Or onto, you could get onto the five minute news bulletins on the commercial radio stations or back to number one trending story on social media. Part of what that is about, I believe, it's about the, it is about the power of voluntary suffering, of sacrifice for the sake of love. As Christians, we should know about this. This is what the cross is about, the cross of Jesus. And about how it brings conversion and change. Because conversion is what is needed, both an ecological conversion and a political one, in the broadest sense of the word political, not really meaning party political. And there's a quote from Henry David Thoreau, who wrote on civil disobedience over 150 years ago. When he was visited in prison for refusing to pay a poll tax, which could have been used to fund the American war in Mexico, he was asked, why are you here? And his response was, why are you not here? I also think of a quote from Eugene Debs, an American radical about 100 years ago, who said, while is, there is a lower class, I'm in it. While there's a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Do we have that same sense of solidarity, of communion, of union with all who suffer, including God's creatures and all life on God's earth, which was also expressed by Jesus when he said, whenever you do this to the least of these, those who are hungry or thirsty or homeless, in prison, etc., etc., you do it to me. Do we really feel this is being done to us too? And Thoreau argues that individuals should not permit governments to overrule or atrophy their conscience, that they have a duty to avoid allowing such acquiescence to enable the government to make them agents of injustice. Are we allowing the government to make us agents of injustice by our silence? What do we do about that? What do we think about Christians in particular? To take the most extreme example that we all know of, who during the Nazi era in Germany stayed quiet and didn't do anything. Do we think it was enough for people to verbally express their dismay about what was happening? Are we not bound by our faith to live by our conscience, to be conscientious objectors to the war on God's earth? In actual fact of the way we live our lives and resist what is going on, and in a way that actually really costs us something. Are we willing to pay the cost of discipleship or do we still prefer cheap grace? In CCA, we always used to talk about action commensurate with the seriousness of the situation. Martin, two more minutes till 20 past. Okay. What does that look like now? I would like to ask what kind of political change do we think is necessary for the change that is needed? I would argue at the very least it's a massive political earthquake probably beyond anything that we've seen in the West since 1945. What's going to create that? How is God going to be able to bring about that kind of change? Do we think that kind of change in a good direction has ever happened without a lot of people being willing to put their freedom, reputation, and even their lives on the line? I'm absolutely sure it hasn't. So if we want God to act, if we want to help bring about that change, are we willing to act? Are we willing to pray for the courage to act? Are we willing to look at what changes we might need to make in our lives to give us enough free space to act? A few things to think about.
when we break into chat groups. I'm just going to probably go a minute over a brief. A second question that was asked in the chat box last week was how about the process of discerning whether it's right for any given person to risk going to prison? Are there circumstances where it might not be a good idea? I certainly think if you've got fragile mental health, it's probably not a good idea, certainly for any length of time. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, obviously, the issue really is to decide whether to do the action. And it's entirely reasonable to pull out, like if a close family member, for example, was to die or a serious illness, for example. The discernment is of the action, what is needed right now. Is this what God is calling you, me, to do? I don't know whether people are aware of methods of discernment in general. For example, Ignatian methods of discerning good and evil spirits, uh, systematized by Saint Ignatius. And, you, um, and of course, there are people who are totally committed, who are more effective by being on the outside, not on the inside. And there are many, even most times, when it is more important to be on the outside. We're not talking about spending our whole lives in prison, just the willingness to spend some time there. But the third question from the chat box, we bring in Kathy now, and after that, um, Tim, uh, is what is prison really like in everyday life? Um, There's a comment, uh, is it really that dreary? <laughs> they in, they out. So uh, I'd like to bring in Kathy, but Kathy first. I will say at the end that obviously XR have much more uh, detailed, have a lot of presentations on this. You can find a lot more elsewhere, but we just thought a bit on this would be good now. So Kathy, ask Kathy to go first in particular because women's business are very different to men's and often the women end up going second. I thought if the air time for Kathy first. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Martin. Um, that was really incredible listening to you speak just then. I'm really glad this is being recorded. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to share it. Uh, I've got think. I, have I got five minutes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm. Uh, I've been in prison twice uh, for a week in, each time on remand, um, following actions I did with XR. Um, prior to being part of XR, I'd never broken the law in my life. Um, I never even got detention at school. Um, but I understand the need to take right action at this point to the point of going to prison and making that sacrifice. Um, before um, being in prison as an inmate, I did work in prisons quite a lot. Um, uh, I set up a, a, a charity that does music projects in prisons called Good Vibrations, and I ran that charity for about 10 years. It's still going, although I no longer um, actively involved. So I, I have worked in male and female prisons. It's very different being an inmate. Um, I, I think just as it's, oh gosh, what to say in five minutes? It's, um, so headlines, it's doable. Um, there's a huge difference being in prison because you want to be there uh, compared with everyone else around you who is there. I mean, I, I really noticed this um, in women's prisons. People are there, the women are there because they've really messed up or the system more or more accurately, the system has really failed them. Um, so they're very tragic places. Um, and I would say the same is true of men's prisons as well, having worked in many. Um, so there's a huge amount of sadness and shared, there's almost a solidarity amongst the inmates, um, a sort of shared understanding of each other's uh, sort of grief and loss. Um, and I can imagine that that is unbearable and hellish, but for those of us that are doing an action and going to prison as part of it, we want to be there and it just makes a huge difference. Um, I remember the second time I went to prison, 
which was after I disobeyed in the dock. So I'd super glued myself to the dock in court and live streamed and went to prison for a week straight from court. I arrived in prison and I, I felt absolutely blissfully happy. Um, it was like this was where I was supposed to be. I could not have done anything else. Um, it was, uh, yeah, an amazing <laughs> feeling. <laughs> and I, I had a very good night's sleep. Um, and that feeling stayed with me pretty much. So I think there's a huge difference for those of us that are there by choice and because we've taken right action and the prison population at large. Uh, the, the hardest thing for someone like me in prison, and it may apply to some of you as well, is I'm middle class, educated uh, woman of a certain age, mother. Um, so I'm used to being in control and like, having everything just so and knowing what's going to happen and having some say in things and in prison um that's not the case everything is very arbitrary you have no control over anything um you're told something might ha is going to happen and it doesn't happen um things are quite random and you just that i think for me that's the great learning experience of going to prison for someone like me is learning about how to not how to be okay in that kind of situation um which is good practice, of course, for what is coming down the line as things collapse around us, as we face societal collapse. We are, of course, going to have to let go of that sense of having stuff around us that um, gives us comfort, being able to control things and, and so on. So I think that's the hardest thing about being in prison. Um, for those of us that, I mean, you're all Christians, so presumably you will pray, pray and stuff. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not um, of any particular faith, but I meditate. And I think having that kind of contemplative practice is really good um, because you're stuck in a cell. Um, a prison cell, you do get a window, so at least you can look out of the window, but it is quite boring. Um, so some kind of practice like that would be very helpful. Um, also, you get books, um, you're allowed to take in books with you. So, yeah, um, I, do, I, I never found it boring, actually, but um, I, I suppose some people might. Um, and there's a huge amount of sort of practical day to day stuff that I could share with you, but we, I can't in five minutes. So I would really recommend going to um, one of the going on remand sessions that are being offered um, to people in CCA in XR and Insulate Britain, which is the thing I'm currently part of. So do go along to one of those sessions. There's lots of practical info about what you're allowed to take in, in your bag, the food, um, the showers, you know, all that kind of stuff you can find out about. Uh, so yeah, I think I'll leave it at that and I'll stick around for the breakout rooms as well. I think we're going to have some questions before the breakout rooms as well, Kathy. So you could do that. Uh, is there, Tim, do you want to say anything in a few minutes? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I agree with um, with Kathy. A lot of what she, well, I agree with everything she said. Um, I think for me, the I've, I was I've been in prison once. It was for six days, so shorter than Kathy, and it should have been seven. But I think they um, they kicked us out by mistake a little bit early. But that hey, that was fine. Um, uh, I think the overriding thing was is that, that I'm aware of with Kathy is a sense of uh, lack of control. Um, you're in the system. It's actually different. It feels quite different from being in a, in a police holding cell. Um, you're actually taken from that. Um, and, you know, even going in the, in the security van, you know, you know that things are very different. The temperature has been ramped up. But having said that, I want to qualify it all by saying, actually, the, the most important thing is, is doable. Um, you know, we're choosing to do it. I, I, I've no idea, you know, it would be horrendous um, facing years of it. I don't know how people do that. A friend of mine was was convicted of 
fraud. Uh, he was innocent, uh, he was an accountant and convicted of fraud. Um, and he spent three years in prison, which is just awful. Um, but so it, it is very doable. I mean, um, there is, um, um, I found that the, um, I think the most important thing for me was actually maintaining a sense of res mutual respect. So I respected the prisoners for that they were, had to do something that I would struggle to be able to, to do. Um, a lot of them, there was a lot of feelings of injustice and um, in, in prison. Uh, with some of the stories you might, I might have agreed, you know, that actually, um, you know, this does sound unjust. And on other occasions, you might think that actually, no, you know, this, this guy is ranting and raving and trying to break the door down with a, um, with a chair. And actually, he's in the right place. You know, actually, this is the system working. <laughs> um, but um, I've, I found, so I wanted to exert, uh, I wanted to demonstrate respect to the um, prisoners and also to the prison officers. They've got an incredibly difficult job to do. And I'm sure there are some who are, who um, may get the service a bad name, but the ones that I, I came across, I found um, very supportive. Um, in fact, one, when I asked for a blessing from the chaplain, which you have to ask to see the chaplain because they spend most of their time doing, um, uh, de-radicalization programs these days um, as the chaplain was blessing me from the door the prison officer who was a senior prison officer stepped forwards and joined in the blessing um, of me um, which was very moving and said namaste to me afterwards um, which I you know that was that was amazing um, yeah so again you know there's lots of information um, one thing I did enjoy doing was, um, oh, the food. I think you've got to be a bit careful with the food. Um, Diana pointed this out a little while back that I heard. Uh, it's very stodgy. Um, there's a lot of bread, a lot of pasta. Um, and um, if, you're, if your gut's not used to it, don't have it. <laughs> um, I, I was, um, and the other thing is they offer everybody a, a, a vape. Um, and it's always it's you know when you go in it's it's in, it's tempting to take anything that's free um you know that you're offered and um but you know if you don't smoke then don't take a vape um because they're addictive and um you know, might might be tempting to use it but don't um so i found the experience um challenging but doable and like kathy it was actually strangely uplifting because I felt I was actually in the right place, you know, I, I actually, and I was so uplifted by lots of people from um, uh, sending me emails. Um, over, the, um, over the six days, I had 140 emails and they were slipped under the door. Um, and it was just so moving having that support. On one or two occasions, I'd, I was reading them and I had to get off my bed and go and wash my face because I found that I was just sort of weeping so much. But it was that, but it was so supportive, and and I felt uplifted by that. Um, so uh, I, you can you can get books from the uh, book trolley, uh, which are on each landing. I found a book. Um, it took me a while to get the right one, but I found a book. It was called a book, uh, a room with a view, <laughs> which I didn't have. And Ben was on the top bunk, so I didn't have I, whatever view there was. I didn't see much. Um, but I was able to feed a pigeon through the bars, which was nice with bits of crust from his bread. Um, and it actually felt as if the, um, the pigeon was ministering to me. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very, thanks very much. So we've got a bit of time people can ask. If people have got questions they don't want to ask before we go into the breakout rooms, we can do that. Uh, Val? Do you think you were treated differently than other prisoners by the prison officers? Who, me? Yes, or uh, any, uh, any of you. Sorry, Kathy, you had a hand up, maybe you'd like to answer that, Kathy. Yeah, I think probably. Um, 
I, because I think the prison system, like the rest of the criminal justice system, and in fact, a lot of institutions in society is uh, racist and classist. So I think as a, a middle class white woman of a certain age, yeah, I probably was treated differently. Um, yeah, it's the same when we get arrested, I think. Um, Tim, do you want to say something? Um, I didn't feel that. Um, when um, when we were taken out of the holding cell to, um, you know, to see the admitting um, prison officer, he said the last the last thing we want is people like you in here. Um, so actually, it worked against in, in against us in some respects. Um, a lot of people. I mean, I wasn't keen to tell people while I was there. Um, I didn't really want to engage with their prejudice about, you know, me as a, as a somebody who's in a position to choose to go to prison. Um, so, um, but I, I, I didn't actually feel that we were getting an, an easier ride. Kathy and Ruth. I just wanted to just say quickly about the other prisoners and um, I really enjoyed the first time I was in prison was pre COVID. So there was more chance to mix on the landing with other women in prison and just um, generally how su supportive they were. Um, pretty much all of them who, who were wanting to chat um, just were really, they really understood why I'd done what I'd done. Um, were very supportive. Some of them thought it was hilarious <laughs> that I stood on a train and glued myself to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I really, I really enjoyed actually meeting the other, and that was something I meant to say before was, um, you, you might also feel this, um, that it's just a really good opportunity to be in an environment that's very difficult, um, quite bleak and quite full of sadness. Um, and, and struggle um, and it's an opportunity to actually be a very positive that you can bring some positive energy in um, and and while being sensitive to the other inmates um, need for privacy you know like it's very clear I think when people want to chat and when they don't want to chat but there is a really good opportunity to reach out and meet people and just yeah just human interactions uh, i really enjoyed that part of it quite challenging as well sometimes ruth you're gonna say something yeah just i'd heard that if people ask you why you're in you tell them tim otherwise they'll think you're a sex offender is what i've heard mm. yeah I, I, nobody, nobody asked me they asked several of them asked ben but they didn't ask me I, I can. Uh, uh, it's a good, good, good point. It's, it's happened to me that yeah. Uh, Bal, did you have your hand up again? Uh, actually, not really. But um, I, I wouldn't mind asking. Oh, uh, um, what is the best sticky stuff in inverted commas to to buy? Because um, I need to buy some. Sorry for, for interrupting with that. I just put it in the chat, but when you glued when you glued on, what was the best stuff? Okay. Dave, did you have your hand up? Dave yeah. Mitchell? Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. Thanks, Martin. No, my question was just around. Um, I thought I heard from someone, whether it was you, Tim, um, when you came out and we're talking about your experience previously someone who said that, yeah, you do get treated differently because you're not viewed as a criminal, you're not viewed as violent or difficult, you're viewed as a like political prisoner or, or some expression like that, and therefore you were treated differently. But I may have not picked that up correctly. Sounds like none of you really relate to that. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really feel that. Um, we, were, we were in the system and everybody was treated the same. Um, um, and I respected that. Uh, I didn't want anything else, and it actually it, it felt right. Um, but uh, one of the aspects about it that differed a little bit from Kathy was that 
because it was COVID, we were only had uh, we were only allowed out of the cells for half an hour a day. Um, um, for us, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, so we didn't have a lot of. Uh, during which time, we either were straight out into the exercise yard, which happened once, or we had to we had an opportunity to have a shower and go onto the um, computer kiosk to move money around and and stuff like that. Um, so there wasn't op a, a great deal of opportunity to talk to people. Um, so um, that's probably why I didn't have, wasn't able to engage with people in quite the same way. Yeah, I will say, I think it's important to say every prison is different. And I think particularly during COVID, um, there's been a lot more restrictions to cells and to mixing. Um, and if you share a cell, in, in women's prisons, it's uh, sorry, in a men's prison, uh, I've always shared with at least with one of sometimes two people. And generally speaking, I think they need someone to talk to as much as anybody else. Or, or the, and it's kind of like your, your family and you look after each other when you share a cell normally, um, to some extent, at least. Um, and I would, my experience in going to prison was that the first thing that they asked was, what are you in for? And that's the first conversation. A bit like when I went to university, it's like, what I lived did you do now? Or what subject, you know? It's the first thing, and it's good to just say it simply, quite simply, don't, don't get complicated about it. But, and generally speaking, I guess a positive. Most people in prison are convinced that the establishment is fundamentally corrupt for understandable reasons in their perspective. So anybody that in their view is anti-establishment, anti that's pretty good by them. So it's, it's not a bad thing to share that information.